Good morning. My name is Karane Tuhiriru. I work with the Digital Media Unit under the Ministry of ICT and National Guard. Good morning. My name is Olara L. Lamara. I'm with the Digital Media Unit, Ministry of ICT and National Guard. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peace Oliver Muge. I work for Women of Uganda Network Movement as the Executive Director. Thank you. Good morning, members. I'm Isaac Sanavulia. I work with Sunny FM. I'm a journalist. Honorable Minister, Madam Pierce, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you. My name is Andrew Tim. I work as the head of strategy at Uganda Communications Commission. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is James Beronda. I'm the head of technical services, uh, the Universal Service and Access Fund under the Uganda Communications Commission. Um, thank you, everyone, for the kind introduction. Uh, Honorable Minister, this is a representation of the various stakeholders in this room. And as you can see, there are others who have joined us uh, over Zoom. Honorable Minister, this is a very uh, important event uh, for the sector, because for quite some time we have had challenges uh, to do with data. And in appreciation also for all the work that has been done by this, the various stakeholders. I would like to invite uh, the Permanent Secretary Ministry of ICT and National Guidance, Dr. Amina Zawede, to come and make a uh, welcome remarks so that you can feel welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you're welcome, Honorable Minister of ICT and National Guidance, the State Minister in Charge of National Guidance, Honorable Godfrey Chavianga of Baruku, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in all your capacities, the media, and all the various stakeholders that are, and the audience we have online. Good morning to you all. I am going to give a uh, brief overview about uh, the report and the purpose that we have for us to be present here today. Um, the purpose that has brought us here today is to launch what we call Uganda's 2021 Inclusive Digital Economy Report. This report provides an overview of the development and inclusiveness of the digital economy of Uganda based on data collected up to the end of May 2021. The data was collected with the participation of various government of Uganda ministries, departments and agencies, but also putting into consideration, because we are saying it's an inclusive report, putting into consideration all the stakeholders involved. We have academia, we have, I've already mentioned MBAs, uh, industry and the private sector, development partners, and we currently have the digital transformation program in Uganda that is in line with the NDP3 and digital vision, as I will talk about later. So all the stakeholders in that program are involved when we're collecting data to input into this inclusive digital economy report. As the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance, we have embraced the inclusive digital economy scorecard, which the report is giving 
as an opportunity for us to track sector development within the context of the Digital Uganda Vision 2040 and the National Development Plan 3, including the Digital Transformation Program. The tool has also provided insights and helped us to identify gaps in policy, regulation, strategy, and implementation that we need to address as a country. Commissioner Julius earlier on said that, you know, we have uh, over the years lacked data to inform our decisions. Many decisions we make are based on observations or what trends are, but we now have an opportunity to make informed decisions based on realistic data collected. So ladies and gentlemen, since the beginning of 2020, the ministry together with the Digital Transformation Program Working Group that is chaired by the permanent secretary has participated in workshops to enable government partners to get an in-depth understanding of the tool, the aspects it considers and the logic behind the measurements it provides. We received feedback from both government and private sector partners as the usability of the tool and the accessibility of the different types of data needed to feed into it and made recommendations for its improvement over the period that we worked on it. We are therefore confident that this tool aligns well with our national digital transformation priorities. We all know uh, recently we had the budget conference in which the Minister of Finance, Honorable Matia Kasaija, emphasized that the government's priority now, among the priorities we have is uh, digital transformation. And this tool is therefore going to play a key role in informing the decisions that we'll take as a sector going forward. So uh, the acronym for this report is IDES for the scorecard. I call it IDES, I know people have the different other connotations to it, but uh, Yes, the Inclusive Digital Economics card, uh, Scorecard Report highlights key challenges that are hindering the growth and inclusiveness of the digital economy in Uganda, including, among others, low access to and usage of ICT among the population, partly as a result of high costs and fees of devices and the internet. We also have uh, inadequate skills for both the users and developers of these systems and limited investment in research and development mentioned but a few. Notably, uh, the ideas shows that while Uganda has a strong digital policy and regulatory environment that has been scored 77%, the scores on infrastructure, skills, innovation and inclusiveness are still considerably low. I know a copy of the report has been distributed or some of you have read it uh, previously, so you'll be able to see these statistics. The high score in existing policy and regulation speaks to the will of the country in achieving an inclusive digital economy. And as a ministry, we are committed to ensuring effective implementation of these policies to achieve a digital economy that works for all Ugandans. To address the gaps that were identified in the report, the ministry has identified the following interventions that are aligned to the digital vision of Uganda. These include uh, the national rollout of infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, we also have development and promotion of digital services, ICT innovation and entrepreneurship, digital skills development and cybersecurity and data privacy. So those five gaps are, the, are what we're going to address going forward as priority areas for us to consider to close the gaps that we have in the digital environment. The ministry acknowledges the contribution of both government and private sector stakeholders that participated in the formulation and review of the inclusive digital economy scorecard. In a special way, I would like to commend my predecessor, Honorable Vincent Bajire, for having seen this as an opportunity for us as a ministry and the sector at large to embrace such a, 
a scorecard that will inform our decisions going forward. It is important for us to make informed decisions as opposed to making subjective decisions, because then we can be able to have tangible measurements on how to move forward. Uh, I would also specifically uh, commend UNCDF for continuously working with the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance to drive our digital Uganda vision. We also, in a special way, thank, uh, sometimes I call him the, the father or grandfather of the ICT sector, Dr. Francis Kusuwiratusu, for ably undertaking this task with the support that you have had from the ministry team. I thank you all for coming and we look forward to fruitful deliberations as we have this event. Thank you for listening, for God and my country. I think uh, I'll hand over the mic to our MC, Julius. Thank you very much, Julius. Honorable Minister, I feel that there are some people in this room who have not introduced themselves fully. They have been making, they are making contributions to another capacity. You, you may know their titles as director so and so, or ED so and so. Uh, Professor Yana and uh, the ED from UCC, uh, the ones who part of the national uh, expert task force that produced the, the strategy for the fourth industrial revolution for the country. So we'd like to appreciate their contribution. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the director of government services, Colin Babirukamu, is also on the innovation selection committee of the ministry. So they are supporting the innovation ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, permit me now to invite the representative of UNCDF to come and make his remarks. Um, we received apology from Chris. And, uh, that he's sending a representative to come and make remarks. Is that correct? Oh, Chris is online. Ah, that's nice too. That's the beauty of technology. So let's have him. Thank you. We are get, still trying to get connection to Chris, who is out of the country. He'll be joining us shortly. Our engineers, are we okay? Uh, Minister of ICT, the permanent secretary, other guests, all protocol observed. Thank you so much for honoring us with your presence here today. My name is Chris Lucolio, and I'm the digital country lead for UNCDF in Uganda. UNCDF since 2019 has implemented a program on building an inclusive digital economy that leaves no one behind. In doing so, we have worked very closely with the Ministry of ICT 
and other government ministries and agencies to try and extend access and usage of digital technologies to underserved communities to make sure that they can improve their productivity and well being. The Inclusive Digital Economy Scorecard is a tool that offers us the opportunity to look inwards at ourselves. Government can look at itself and measure how it's doing in terms of policy, infrastructure, knowledge and skills, as well as innovation in order to achieve the goals of building an inclusive digital economy. It's especially timely as well because the government of Uganda is also implementing and ownership of this tool and is willing to use it to measure and see how, how we're doing, but where we want to be tomorrow. It's also important to mention that the Inclusive Digital Economy Scorecard has been adopted not just by Uganda, but several other countries around the world. So Uganda is leading in this effort in showing others the way in how to measure in order to, in, to, to achieve an inclusive digital economy. Where are we today? Where do we want to be tomorrow? And as we implement the national development plan, we can take stock. We can know where we are next year, the year after that, and so on and so forth. So for us at UNCDF, it is uh, an honor to have the government of Uganda adopt this tool, take ownership of it, and use it. I should also mention that later in September, this tool will also be um, highlighted at the UN General Assembly, where it will be showcased that various countries are taking measures to um, measure how they are doing in terms of uh, policy, infrastructure, innovation, and skills in order to achieve an inclusive digital economy. So Uganda is not alone. And at this forum, the UN General Assembly, this leadership role that has been taken by the government of Uganda will be further highlighted. So from us, it is simply a statement of deep thanks and appreciation, but it's also a reiteration of our commitment to continue to work with the government, with different stakeholders in the public and private sector to achieve an inclusive digital economy that leaves no one behind. And so once again, uh, I thank you and welcome all the guests um, uh, to this forum and look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chris Lucorio. We're very grateful for the partnership that we have in many areas, areas of quality, innovation, many others. And we have big support to the development of the digital transformation program for the country and also supporting the work of the program uh, working group. Uh, Honorable Minister, the TS introduced uh, someone here as grandfather of uh, digital transformation in the country. And, and that is none other than Dr. Uh, Francis, and we have had the privilege of being mentored by him. I was taught, uh, uh, sorry, uh, network, network infrastructure during my master's program by none other than him. I think Commissioner Agoi also, what, and yourself. So, Professor, you can see the, the products you have produced over the years and the role and the responsibilities they are now carrying in the country. So we very much appreciate your work and that you have left us alone. You have continued to move alongside us and also continue to mentor us even in our current roles. So the floor is yours. Please present uh, the, the tool and also the report. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Julius, for those very kind words. 
Let me say that I'm happy with Jaspersu. And I must say I'm delighted to see the impressive leadership we have in the sector nowadays who have come a long way, Honorable Minister and PS. We will have a, a high caliber of people leading the sector now, not like our old days. I remember when we were starting ICT in Makera, and uh, Professor Spoof was very, very enthusiastic. And he used to make the joke that when they asked him, do you know how to use PowerPoint? He said, oh, yes, I've got power socket in my office. <laughs> Times have changed since then. That is a true story, and he's the one who used to share it himself. So, so let's dig, dig in a little bit, and I'll not uh, repeat what has already been covered uh, by the PS, Dr. Amina. Um, we measure and track, we identify key market constraints, and this is a very central bit of it. It's not simply about talking about what a wonderful job we are doing, but we must talk about it based on evidence. And when you talk about inclusiveness, we all know the groups we talk about, the women, the youth, people with disabilities. We sometimes forget the refugees, they are part of this, the migrants. Uganda is a welcoming country. I remember all the way from the 50s, which is when I started going to primary school, that we welcomed refugees, not in camps, but as part of the community. And therefore, if I've got such a big refugee population, we cannot talk about development if they themselves are not enabled. And therefore, it's about enabling everybody within the country so that we are at the same level. We all know that to achieve real economic impact, I see it must be all inclusive. We have discovered recently, and I had the pleasure of sharing this with the conference in Dar es Salaam last week, where I had to give a keynote, that you know, and this is for you, Irene. Initially, when you talked about rural communications development, we thought about small links to little people in the village doing almost nothing. But now, extending infrastructure to rural communities means education. It means distance learning for the universities. So it means inclusion, not just of the rural communities, but everybody else, because we are now displaced from our traditional locations of work. And indeed, our locations of work are also going to change. I don't know that schools are going to remain schools as they are now. Maybe like computers. You know, we used to go to mainframes to do our computing with the decks of cards. Nowadays, we own computers. So maybe I don't need to leave Utongo, the way I come from near of Sembatia which has at last got some fiber passing by, come to university, maybe I can send the village at lower cost and do my learning there. And therefore, in setting the priorities right, we look at policy and regulation because this really sits at the top. We look at the infrastructure, we look at innovation and we look at skills. Now, uh, I'll give some information about Irina. Sometime in the early 2000s, we had uh, a program covering Sub-Saharan Africa, developing capacity for policymakers and regulators in the way of new liberalization. And Irene was in charge of skills building. And the emphasis was on evidence-based policy. We all know that our president, His Excellency, likes figures and evidence. And for a long time, ICT has been telling the story just in terms of what oh, no, ICT is important and so on and so forth but we don't have numbers. We can talk about the penetration of funds, but we don't have the impact. And that we are trying to shift beyond that so that when we make a case, it is a strong case at ICT that this sector really needs more support. The current financial support to this sector in terms of the national budget is almost negligible, frankly, compared to other countries like Kenya, like Rwanda, and so on. And we need to make the case because nobody can make the case except the people in this room so that we can then guide policy, inclusive policy. As has been said by Christie's, an iterative, consultative process. The tool even now is not completed because things are changing very fast. And therefore, the tools con continue evolving and we continue using it. And therefore, we rely on the stakeholders, the academics in their research, the, the regulators, the people in NITAU, the policy makers, to keep on bringing forth the evidence that we need to maybe tweak this a little bit so that the people can then perform better. But the bottom line is that we need to be informed at all stages about what we are doing. And that's what we are saying. 
the development of the two involved consultation with ministries, uh, departments, and agencies in several countries, including Uganda. And for Uganda, there was special focus on aligning it with NDP3. And this step led to revision of the two, and if now to being revised. We carried out the first data collection starting from about uh, February 2021 and to the end of May 2021. And therefore, the data on which the findings are based now goes up to about the end of May 2021. We know things have moved on, and therefore, that is also going to change. I should mention that we do have gaps because we also need international comparators. And therefore, some of the information is derived from organizations like the Global the GSMA, the GSM Association. And therefore, if we don't send statistics in time to the challenge of developing countries, we find that they are utilizing statistics from about two or three years ago. And this again puts emphasis on our minister and PS on getting our agencies, NITA U and uh, UCC, to ensure that we are sending up data to all these organizations all the time. Because they do the global comparative. And based on those, investors make decisions. What is happening in Uganda in terms of policy, in terms of regulations, in terms of enabling environment, in terms of coordination around implementation. Now, from that, we then come up with the result. But I thought I should say something about the real evaluating questions we look, look at. So while the data is given in terms of numbers, the questions we look at are digging into the actual policy, some kind of policy analysis to find out what policies have been developed and are they inclusive? Because the inclusivity starts at the policy level. In our number of workshops, and Julius, I think you remember it as guys, one of the things we commented on is that if you talk about inclusivity, then we must include consultation with the target groups right from the word go. Because there's a general tendency, sadly, in Uganda, that policies are formulated at the higher level and then implemented at the lower level without the participation of the beneficiaries. And therefore, inclusivity at the policy level going forward is going to include through the program working group, the digital transformation program working group, ensuring that each policy default has got the input right from the beneficiaries to the very top. And then after that, we take it down. If there's a good policy, are those policies being actualized through laws, regulations, and strategies? And are these inclusive? This is going to go along with looking at whether or not strategies are funded. Now, back on the issue of government board, and I know that one thing which comes up is the phrase unfunded priority. So it's, it's a bit puzzling. If it is a priority, I need it to be unfunded. And therefore, I, I think we have discussed with the PS at uh, Dr. Anna. With this, that if you don't have a budget for policy, why develop that policy in the first place? It is just a document sitting on your shelf. And then you say, well, produce this policy, but what has it led to? So are the policies actualized through laws, regulations, and strategies? And are these inclusive? And then the institutions, are there institutions which can show implementation? And we do have this but we all recognize that we sometimes have a challenge of coordination, even beyond ICT. Because when I mean, if we're talking about rolling out infrastructure, we have got the roads people doing their thing, we have got the rails people doing their thing, the oil people are doing their thing, the power transmission people are doing their thing, the telecom operators are doing their thing. And after the road is laid out today, next day somebody is going to cut across the road, the other day, somebody is going to cut along the road. The other day, somebody is going to dig holes on the other side of the road for poles and so on. And we say, are we operating in the same country? And therefore, institutions extend to collaboration across the institution so that we get coordinated development of infrastructure like other countries do. I know our neighbor Tanzania does this. Okay, they are rather autocratic about it, but they do call everybody together and say that, yes, this is going to happen here. Yeah? This road is going to be laid in place. For the next 20 years, nobody can do anything in that area unless you bring it forward now so that it's integrated in planning. And then after the institution, do the results, outputs and outcomes demonstrate effectiveness? 
So we evaluate by squaring all the way from the top coming downwards. And then things like are the fundamental underlying requirements in place. Let's take innovation as an example. We know that we have got very strong policies around developing an innovation ecosystem about IT and about services. But then, have we addressed the skills levels required for that? I know at one point we are talking about English and so on as important, uh, an important asset. But hey, what is happening in technology? Uh, my colleague from Computer School of Computer Science will tell you that chatbots are now the method of delivering services. And that's where you're going to find that your good English is not going to serve you any purpose because somebody is interacting with a chatbot online without having to make a call and wait in a tube and getting the service they want immediately. So do we have the fundamental skills coming up right from the lowest level to the high level so that we can then talk about sustaining this industry? Uh, when I was with Anita, we talked about starting cyber clubs at primary school level. And I hope this has now happened at uh, Director e government Services. I hope this is happening. Because if we don't do these things, then we are really deceiving ourselves. We cannot get people ignorant about ICT all oh, that first time in university and then all of a sudden expect them to become experts. So the evaluative questions then lead to this call. And this is what we have so far, just a quick, a quick illustration because they are going to look at the report. As the PS said, we are excellent in policy and regulation. Of course, we can go high, and I know we shall. But if we are excellent in policy and regulation, why do we have skills so low? Innovation and infrastructure. It means that there's a gap somewhere. Because if there's excellence at the top level, it should extend all the way down the chain. And these are the gaps we try to identify using ideas. We get back to the policies. We look at the strategies and the funding. We look at the implementation and say, where are the gaps that the ministry and their partners need to focus on? So that the program working group has got some real coordination and work to do. If you look at inclusiveness, it sounds good. If you look at 65% of it is above the barest path mark. But we're saying that about 65% of the population are excluded from the digital economy. And we can't develop like that. A positive side to that is that uh, the consistent focus on now uh, women has made a difference. So they are higher than the national average, but still 65% is that a major 35% is still left out. So we can interrogate this and say, what are the reasons for that? We don't have all the answers, Minister. But as time goes on, what is happening and with the digital transformation program working group, we should identify this gap and then get them addressed to policy or implementation or regulation, whatever it is. Adjustments are required to ensure that something can happen. When you start breaking down, just again giving quick highlights, take policy and regulation, for example, as we saw in the previous slide. No, we don't have it yet, sorry. Okay. As we saw on this slide, policy and regulation are 77%. But at, what are the components that we look at in terms of policy and regulation? You might have the policy and regulation, but you need active government promotion. So that takes it beyond the judgment, something which is being done by government. You need active policy promotion, and you especially need regulation. And again, regulation, because very hard, we have, we have got highly. We have got good regulations in place, and I think the TS also said so. But again, there's some gap in translation, because if policy is good and regulation is excellent, then the result should also be good. What about infrastructure? What are the elements? The overall average is 51%. But the national identification infrastructure is still a bit weak. And we all know why. Because the national ID system was conceived so that all users who need access can utilize it as a reference point to confirm who they are dealing with. This means that if I go to a bank, by simply taking my fingerprint, they should get a return which says that the person whose fingerprints those are is so and so and so and so and so and so. 
But this is still not happening. You still find that to go with your national ID to, 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 to get a, a driving permit, to open a bank account, to get a SIM card. And therefore, this database is in place. But it is being used in a pedestrian way because it's just being utilized to generate identification cards. The real purpose and value is when it is online so that by simply placing my fingers and getting a picture taken, I can be identified, just like we do at immigration when we're traveling around the world. And therefore, now, Minister, this is a major gap which needs to be addressed. How can we take the identification infra infrastructure to the real value to the citizens so that I know that when I go to a bank, I don't have to fill in certain forms to start e-banking. And then connectivity, again, that is doing quite well. But if connectivity is good, why is coverage limited? And I think we all know it is because we focus on the main trunks. So there is generally good coverage along the main trunks and not everywhere. Those of you who drive, who drive up to Lira and Guru, and I do that quite often, know that there's a place beyond Nakasongora where you can barely get connectivity and you're along one of the major highways to the north. And therefore, it means that even along the main arteries, we've got gaps in terms of coverage that we need to address. ICT usage and ownership, Honorary Minister, yes, this is, uh, this is distressing because 27% is really bad. Let's, let's use the right word, it is bad. We need to do a lot more to ensure that this happens. And again, I think the regulators will tell you that part of this is the cost of the devices. It's about conflicting policies. Minister of ICT is trying to reduce the cost of devices and utilization. Minister of Finance is trying to make money so that we can, so that we can go up. So, so th th this is what the challenge is. I mean, uh, my data package went up recently from about 220,000. It's a Wi-Fi per month to 50,000. Oh, I can afford it, but look at it in terms of those other people somebody who needs education and so on. Okay, they say some of those are going to be excused, but if I've got students in my house, grandchildren in this case, then they're not excused. So there are still issues around that on our minister. So there is the 4% level, that's where it starts. 2% of that goes back to government, right? And then there's all oh, yes, 2% and one goes back, okay? So they start with 1% of overall level, then you have got the VAT at 18%. Then you have got the excise duty at 12%. Then you have got taxes on devices and so on. And this is why these things are failing. Then digital payment is another area because if you can push that up, the banks will rejoice. And if the banks rejoice, if interest rates can go down, then people can invest more in the business. People will be attracted to borrow money to expand their businesses. But right now, the high cost of doing business in Uganda, a lot of it is about uh, our old uh, fashion transactions. I was in Sweden about uh, five years ago again. And on most of the restaurants and the shops, it was very clear. We don't accept cash on every shop. We need to get to that level. And then innovation, which is the dream of Uganda. The community is strong, but skills at 35%, infrastructure at 35%, and investment at 20%. So we're not dealing with the entire ecosystem of innovation. Where are the real gaps here? What are we doing for these innovation centers in terms of access? Why don't we look at countries like Kenya that have excelled because they have got incentives in place that really promote innovation. And these are our neighbors. Even Rwanda might overtake us. I think they've actually done so already, haven't they? I think. Yes, they've overtaken us already. And yet we are, the, we are like the pioneers trying to push this and yet nothing is happening. So we need to look at this carefully on our minister so that we can see where the gaps are and address them. And then skills. Basic skills, this is the read, write, arithmetic, right? Those are the basic skills. They have now changed by the basic skills are no longer that they are now about communication, but collaboration and so on and so forth. But that's not the discussion here. But we've got a big up in digital literacy. And we believe it is important that we start exposing our children to digital literacy right from primary school. 
our businesses fail because people retire from government and think they can start a business. And they just can't. So digital literacy is a big, big gap. And financial literacy is another one. So there's no coordinated national effort anywhere that is trying to ensure that our population has got both digital literacy and financial literacy. And these are major areas of intervention if we think we are going to push up everything else, because without that, no progress can be made. About overall inclusiveness, this just gives a quick snapshot of, snapshot of, of where we are with everything. So overall, 55% of the population are included. When you go to the rural areas, it's only 27%. For women, 65%, about the highest. You, 57%. For older people like me, we are 23%. Some I'm excluded, I think, on average. Yes, on average. Refugees, 29%. Migrants, people with disabilities. So again, we see the areas where we need focus in terms of policy, consistent intervention, and support in terms of increasing overall inclusiveness. We believe that the sustained focus on inclusiveness for women has made a big difference, but not for the other groups. Then for the medium, small scale and micro enterprises, it is quite good, but I think this most, mainly because most of them are actually urban and therefore they're more included. But the telling figures are rural, older people, refugees, migrants, and people with disabilities. We need this address at both the policy, strategy, and implementation level. So to reduce exclusion on our minister, and this is just a quick summary, we need to move from good policies into effective implementation of both policy and regulation. And I've got all the agencies concerned here, all the stakeholders. The digital transformation program working group has got to become much more effective because it's supposed to be a strategic platform for the development of the digital economy in Uganda. But I think we have not yet exploited that opportunity. Part of this on I mean stand out state, I believe I might embarrass uh, the ministry. The ministries is that most ministries, when they talk about the meeting of the digital transformation PWG, instead of the PS who can make decisions, they send the IT engineer. And that's not about strategy. We need strategic thinking and decision making levels in this group if we think it's going to actually carry forward the program. So sending people who don't have to make decisions, who have got the mother may I attitude all the time, is a waste of time. And that's why, I think that's why many of them don't attend. I'm not mentioned who because I know them. Then policy initiatives around ownership of ICT. We think that is also very, very important. By the way, when I threw, we minister, it's not me, it is uh, my colleagues in the ministry, it is the program, program working group. So we think for clarity is the program working group. And then we need to step back and rethink policy, strategy and implementation, especially around innovation. We know His Excellency, the president is very passionate about this area. We also know that he's very frustrated around this area. And therefore we need to step back and instead of simply pushing something not working, let's maybe build a new car so that we can move faster. And then the national deficiencies in basic skills and the digital skills. I don't know, Bank of Uganda cannot be this task to get back to the Ministry of Education, but Bank of Uganda, the financial institution, the technical training institution, financial literacy should be a cross-cutting force across all disciplines, right from the highest level, in my view. We need more involvement. By the way, do we have anybody from education here or online, Ministry of Education? Thank you very much. <laughs> Good to see you. In that case, I'm going to reserve all my remarks so that I don't get in trouble. But yes, education is critical to all this because they're in charge of education and therefore these schools we're talking about that are your responsibility. Then Minister of Labor and Industry, do we have any representative? Minister of Labor? You see colleagues uh, online, eh? Okay, if, if they are, it's good. But we talk about the evolving nature of skills because of the fourth industrial revolution. And now the fifth coming on, which is kind of trying to moderate the fourth. 
we find that the skills required for jobs are evolving very fast. And therefore, the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Labor have got to be really in touch with that all the time. Because to address the skills needs for five years' time, the curriculum must change five years ago. So we're already late for some of these things. We almost need an intensive effort to ensure that we can catch up. So honorable minister and colleagues, these are just quick highlights, but I hope that it gives some sense of what it is we're talking about. So that working together, we can actually create a difference. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thank you, honorable minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, and thank you very much for really, really opening our eyes. The figures you have presented are very telling. And indeed, it needs concerted effort of all stakeholders. And that's why in this room, we have representation of all the sectors, uh, civil society, development partners, academia, government, private sector, and some of them have joined us also uh, online. So um, we'd like to interrogate what uh, Tuso has presented further, in case you like to make a comment or you like to ask a question, please let us know. Uh, I know the minister is constrained of time, but we'll uh, allow just a few so that we can uh, proceed. Uh, any question or comment? Uh, even those who are online can be able to uh, post questions or comments, uh, which will be read by the our moderator. Someone? Oh, yes, uh, James. Do you have a mic? Or you? Uh, thank you to so for, for for the wonderful presentation. Mine is just uh, I don't know that's a question or comment, but you probably figure out. Uh, and I would love to hear from you. You've talked about thinking at that strategic level. I come from the commission where we run the universal service fund. And uh, we're always championing the use of ICTs, reducing the cost of internet, reducing the cost of devices. That's our language, and that's what we do on a daily basis. Sometimes we also face with challenges. On one side, we're promoting this. The next day, the exercise on internet is increasing. It is sort of a bit counter. So how do you think we should work government, especially at the planning stage? Are we able to be in the same room and speak sort of the same language that this is what we want to do? We should therefore think strategically like this. Because yes, finance is about getting that money at whatever cost, but what impact does it have on our masses? So when should we have that strategic level talking so that we, we are not sort of countering ourselves because it makes my work so difficult. Every time I go, I said, I need to get you online. I need to do this. Then the following day, taxes have increased. They, they, they think you're joking. You can't be saying this and then doing this on the other side. I thought I would just highlight that out. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I don't say much about that. This probably goes to the honorable minister because the advance of it at uh, the national level. But the, the challenge we face is still planning in silos and I think failing to take the long-term view of the country. I told, um, I think it was then honorable Nasser that when you overtax the inputs and to me data and connectivity are inputs into businesses. It's like taxing the grass the cows are going to eat. 
really, if you think about it sensibly, and I'm not saying government is not sensible. If you think about it sensibly, no, no, for, for clarity, please don't misquote me. You should say, let us feed the cow properly so that when the cow is well fed, it will produce a lot of milk. And if it is beef, then we are going to get a lot of beef. And then we can tax those outputs. But because we focus on the short term, we look at where can we immediately get money. But if I project taxes in five, eight years time, and say, supposing I pull down the cost of connectivity, supposing I pull this down, uh, the taxes and so on, how much growth would that push into the economy? And what would I be getting in five, 10 years time? So that you take a longer term view of the national benefit. I think this is why we're going wrong here, honestly. And I believe it is only the ministry level, the, the PS and the minister, who have got the influence and the political clout, carry that to the upper levels. And I think this is why they are here. We hope this is actually going to happen. It is sad, it's really sad that this, this happens all the time. Thank you, presenter. I'm Humphrey Mkoyo from Minister of Education and Sports. Well, what the former the, the, what uh, you, you've talked about taxes is a big problem. You tax from one item, then you drop it on bundles. Now we are in a, a quagmire where children have to learn from home. You know the use of ICT so much, but because you don't have those funds to buy even bundles for them, we try to limit them. Well, actually, this is the time for them to be creative and innovative. I don't know what can be done in that direction. But uh, also, I would like to call on Minister of ICT. Since 2005, we've been waiting for the last mile connection. I don't know when that will happen. <laughs> Maybe prices will go down a bit. We are faced with a lot of hurdles when we go to these institutions. They're always complaining about data, 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 but you can't do much. You, your hands are tight. Maybe the Minister of Rights yeah. right, could give us something firm that we can pass over to those people. Then, as Minister of Education, we brought on board industry under the Uganda Steering Council. We try to find out what they need so that we try to to change the curriculum to reflect the needs of the industry. And I think that is uh, something we are doing in the right direction, but uh, we need even to go further to the primary section and to the secondary section so that uh, we can talk with one voice. And at the end of the day, our curriculum will become more meaningful because it will be serving the purpose of the industry and the government will be able to get the taxes they are earning for. But um, my big question is still last mile connection. Maybe Minister of Ice if you can give us a word on that one. Because this has been on since two Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I know before the minister answers, uh, he has got his left hand. So with your permission, maybe we can get a word from both uh, Uganda Communications Commission and Nita you. And then the minister will know what to say after that. I, I think that's only fair. So with your permission, I'll minister, I'll start with my friend here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Where is Thank you to Sue for always putting me on the spot. I was actually looking forward to coming up, um, especially when James Stickle. Firstly, um, for me, this is a very welcome issue because one, you cannot know the progress you're making unless you appreciate where you are now. And you cannot measure your progress unless indeed you have clarity on what progress are you seeking to have. So this is a very welcome initiative on our part. Um, 
In terms of last mile connectivity, yes, this comes in many forms. And when we come to the academia, I always talk about Renews. My colleague James talked about the issue of partnership. When we started the ICT program, we thought it's a catalytic effect that we're going to tickle the schools, the Ministry of Education and those quickly jump on board. We know the challenges that our colleagues have had. So this has not happened as we have in this age. But how do we all come together as that whole of government approach? And it goes back to what Tus was talking about, about removing the silos. As we talk about our colleagues and the taxes, one of the challenges that they have been putting to us is we want local statistics. Of course, I cannot prove that reducing the taxes will cause benefit unless you remove the taxes. So when I'm looking for the statistics, what do I use? But when we have this kind of collection where we have a deliberate monitoring of the changes and where the gaps are, again, it goes back to what we were talking about, what I'm sure the Honorable Minister will be sharing in the collaborations and discussions we've been having with other parts of government, where we are talking, but we have nothing to show for it. How do we show that this is the gap? How do we show that this is the incremental benefit that will be realized? This is where we really need the statistics. Going back to the question, um, I alluded to the RENU. Research and Education Network of Uganda is one of the efforts I am very proud that I supported. Why is this? At the time when they came in, it sounded like a dream that may never come to be. But imagine we all talk about the fact that in the data community, it's about economies of scale. The more people you have, the less each of you has to pay if you all come together. And that's what the education community did. They brought together the institutions of education and research so that they bulk buy. And the tremendous success they have had in terms of reducing the costs they pay. Unfortunately, because they are, maybe because they are academician, they don't blow their own trumpet. But if we had more schools and education institutions come together in that board, we believe they would get more benefits. In some cases now, Edurom, for example, is able to provide students free Wi-Fi off campus location. But many people don't know about this. So if we brought more as institutions on board, there are economies of scale to be, they, you, then each education institution does not need to go and negotiate by itself with an operator for it, because it is now coming as a group and negotiating. And this big mass becomes attractive also to the operators. They have achieved a lot in terms of the last mile connectivity you're talking about they are actually getting operators to help them address it, even without waiting for the government NBI. NBI is one of the suppliers of RENU. So where NBI is not available, they look at the other market alternatives to provide that last mile. Uh, going back to what we're talking about and the whole up, up issue of affordability, and you talked about the comparative indices. It is very one of the sticky issues I have with my colleagues against some of the bodies that assess us. For us in Uganda, most people are on wireless. I was listening to a colleague yesterday in the US. For them, they've been having a very high penetration of fiber to the premises, but they're also admitting that their people want wireless. Now, when they're assessing us as where are we in terms of affordability, they are looking at how much bandwidth an individual is buying. Now, our people are typically small bundle users, a day, a few hours. So even among uh, the strategies and priorities we are looking at, it is important that we build that usage so that, again, we are being compared fairly because we won't force them to change their matrices. They've refused, we're arguing, but they've still refused. But how do we make sure that 
all the effort that is will reduce all this, but for as long as we're still having those small bundle individual usage, we are still going to be rated low, yet in actual fact, we're making very good progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irene and Honorable Minister, Madam PS. Thank you. I think let me just do a brief addendum uh, based on the education use case. Um, but I think what's really key to say, just talk about the backbone, I think, then, then the device access. Um, I mean, NITA has obviously, uh, under the Ministry of ICT, has rolled out more than 4,000 kilometers of fiber. The target is in the next year, with the next project, to actually roll out additional 3,000, to make it 7,000. But I think like Professor said, that is heavily on the highways, you could say. We now need to talk uh, last mile. You know, last mile is actually happening right now. But I think we need to think outside the box. It won't be just fiber delivery, but like Irene says, we need to even think wireless. That is quick to roll out. It is more affordable. It may have weather challenges, but it's a much faster way to roll out the last mile. So we have a lot of thinking together in terms of a quicker uh, last mile approach. Talking about education, I mean, we, we had a project with UCC uh, on an e-learning platform now uh, developed by, 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 the U, U, by the UN also called Colibri. And Colibri is now sitting uh, with the Ministry of Education also uh, on, on many labs. And recently in Karamoja, we, we were actually distributing uh, devices to them. But you won't believe it, now with the lockdown, those, those labs that had Colibri are in the schools, but the schools are closed. The biggest issue now may seem to be that we need to look at the device access, even in the households. You know, how can we get an affordable, not just any device, but a smartphone, an affordable smartphone in as many homes as possible. I mean, Honorable Minister, we have a lot of discussions to have, of course, at the policy level, but if we could really bring those costs down on per device, Imagine a smartphone at about 100,000 shillings that can be paid incrementally, maybe over, even cheaper, well, even cheaper. But I know smartphone technology is developing also a bit slowly. But if you could have it even cheaper than 100,000 and a citizen can pay slowly, these are the kind of discussions we really need to have at the highest level, but also with our UNCDF partners. So for me, household access seems to be still top of the, uh, of the agenda. Uh, let me also say, uh, very quickly, I think you talked about, Professor, you talked about the um, NIRA and quick access. I want to say even as our, as our pastor, chairperson for NITA, uh, your, your baby has come to life now. The integration project is now come to life. We're calling it the UG Hub. And the UG Hub, what it does for all the members is that it connects uh, the siloed governments. So imagine NIRA was on its own, URA was on its own, uh, KCCA, and citizens have to go lining up to all these places. And every, way, every time you line up, they ask you for your ID. Again, you identify yourself again. What the bus has done, integration project under the Ministry of ICT and NITA, is to now integrate those siloed uh, organizations that are data controllers. And majorly those big ones like URA, KCCA, are now actually, uh, NIRA are now on board. And guess what? The, the biggest use case, again, the banks have come rushing for, for this service. So now we are piloting some of the banks on. So this UG hub is no longer a concept. It's no longer a project. It's actually gone live. We're only waiting for, of course, the cameras and everything, but it's actually gone, it's actually gone live. So I think I want to just, uh, just encourage everybody that this is actually happening. And uh, NIRA is now integrated on our UG hub. And if you've got an entity, uh, the idea is that people should be able to click and pull your data. Uh, and then, of course, serve you better. The banks, of course, are rushing for it. And we're also rolling out the UG Pass, which is really the digital signature uh, or digital authentication. You should know who you are when you're transacting. You should be able to sign, and we know that that was your signature. And no documents go off, get signed and scanned again. So banks, again, are rushing for that, while also, of course, our government agencies are doing that. So I really want to say that we are, there's some progress here. And we need the minister's support and the ministry's support to continue uh, this good work. Thank you. Um, that is a very positive note. 
for me to take the Sahona to invite the PS, take also the honor of inviting our chief guest. For those who are not able to make comments, our sincere apologies. Uh, read it behind time, uh, but we would like to find ways of uh, sending your comments to us. Thank you very much, uh, UCC and Lita, for giving our, our guests and the audience comfort that we are moving in the positive direction of embracing digital transformation and ensuring that we offer our aim and goal is to offer services to all citizens of this country at an affordable rate. That is the discussion we are now going to have, and especially given this. Uh, Inclusive, inclusive digital economy scorecard. I think we are now going to be able to have uh, more vi uh, vision or more informed decisions on how to proceed with the digital transformation journey. I now take this opportunity to invite our State Minister for National Guidance, Honorable Godfrey Baruku Chavriaga, to give us his remarks and also after that launch the report. Uh, thank you very much, PS. The Permanent Secretary, Ministry of YCT and National Guidance, our colleagues from the academia, representatives from government agencies who have introduced themselves here, our representative from the United Nations Capital Development Band, the consultant who is none other than our respected the uh, Rotary First District Governor, Rotian Tusu, our staff from uh, Minister of ICT and National Guidance have also recognized someone from civil society organization the press, ladies and gentlemen. I first of all bring you apologies from my minister, Honorable Chris Variomusi, who has not been able to, uh, to attend because he was urgently called for another meeting in the president's office. We are opposite of uh, one another. He's a very tall and huge man, so he can see far. And I'm a very short man. I move faster. So whenever <laughs> he's not able, where he's not able to reach faster, he tells me to run fast. And that's why I'm here. I'm delighted to join you here this morning as we launch an all-inclusive digital economy scorecard. The society we live in today is advancing towards the era of modernization in a very rapid manner. Dominated by the overchanging developments of technology, most of us are directly or indirectly affected by the transformation which comes along with digital revolution. I'm indeed excited that we are launching a measurement tool to address inclusion in the digital space. We have now impact on the implementation of the National Development Plan Digital Transformation Program with the aim of increasing ICT penetration 
and use of ICT services for social and economic development. Further, government has mainstream ICT across all sectors. I have, however, been concerned that the country does not have accurate data on aspects of digital transformation, such as the number of kilometers of fiber infrastructure in the country, the number of hours saved by the citizens because of adoption of e-government services, innovation data, and the number of people employed in the ICT sector. As we launch the inclusive digital economy scorecard today, I appeal to various sectors of government to adopt modern approach to data governance, which lead to accurate quality data. More so, as we implement the parish development model, we must track the impact of all government interventions and to monitor implementation effectively. We will therefore put in place a robust security system to automate data collection, processing, storage, and dissemination to key stakeholders. Indeed, Professor Tusu has brought out something very, very important. Recently, I was filling uh, forms of a passport, and they asked me for my mother's NIN number. That was the biggest nightmare. I'm, I'm lucky my mother is still alive. But he last used his NIN number the day he got it. The, the day she got it. Because she has nothing. She has never been asked with any need number anyway. So one, she didn't know where it was. Secondly, even if she knew, reading it to me was very difficult. So I had to look for someone. First of all, to go and assist her, to look for the need number. Two, to take it a photo and send it to me. And it took me seven days. Just looking for my mother's need number. But I started wondering why passport office can't uh, link with the NIRA and put my mother's name there and get all the information about my mother. Professor, the banks are doing relatively better. Because I went to open a bank account recently and I wanted to hide my identity. Because sometimes I don't want to know what people to know what I'm doing. So these are jobs which come and go. So I must live an ordinary part life. But as soon as I gave them my national ID, they asked me for my ID of parliament. And I said, but why? They said, but you are a member of what? Of parliament. So it means they are doing much better than other organizations. But we have taken note and in it are you has promised that they are going to do this so that when you put in your NIN number, all other information about you is going to come out. And indeed, it's even going to fight corruption. The best tool of fighting corruption is IT. So that if I put my NIN number, my name will come, my name, the name of my wife, my children, my mother, actually we should even put my sisters and what? and brothers, so that even if I disguise my property in the names of my sister, it can be what? Trace. That's what we are now tasking Nita you to do for us, so that we can end all this. And I think with your help, Professor, we are going to achieve that. Furthermore, whereas there has been big investment in ICT by both government and the private sector, there has been lack of harmonization of measurements with the industry, industry indicators. This, in part, has led to Uganda being ranked unfavorably in the global ICT index due to lack of visibility. Therefore, this scorecard comes handy in addressing this challenge. As 
a minimum, the country should track the following in digital space. One, the indicators of the development of physical service and security infrastructures underlying the digital economy. It should include access to mobile and fixed networks, the development of next operation access networks, the dynamics of household and business uptake, secure servers infrastructure, and the infrastructure for the fourth industrial revolution technologies, such as cloud computing and internet of things. Two indicators on people's use of internet, education, financial inclusion, and interaction with government, among others. Three indicators that address innovation in digital technology, new digitally enabled business models, the role of ICTs as an engine for innovation and adoption of ICTs and other emerging technologies by business. And four indicators related to the labor market, employment creation, investment in ICTs, value added, international trade, e-commerce, and productivity growth. I urge the Permanent Secretary, Minister of ICT and National Guidance, to further study the scorecard to ensure that it measures the agreed actions in the national strategy on the fourth industrial revolution, which focuses on enhancing productivity in agriculture, transforming human capital development, overcoming the economic opportunity shortfall, and urbanization and human settlement. I wish to inform the country that ICT sector has continued to grow. For example, between July 2020 and June 2021, 3 million new subscribers were recorded. This is a 16% year-on-year growth in broadband subscriptions. In terms of penetration, the 21.9 broadband sub subscriptions translated into broadband penetration of one internet connection for every two Ugandans. This has been crucial during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we will further reduce the cost of internet over the national backbone infrastructure next year after completing the current phase of last mile connectivity. We are working on this and we want by end of this calendar year for it to have taken off. And we are also negotiating with the Minister of Finance to see how we can reduce the taxes on equipment and also services, internet services. And I think we have a lot of goodwill and uh, we are going to sort it out. Just as the professor said, government works in silos and that is the biggest problem, but also even the ministries themselves work in what? <laughs> in the silos, the far government. You meet even in the Ministry of ICT, departments are also working in what? In the silos, departments and agencies. So we are bringing all these people together so that we fight a combined war. Because our minister the other day was saying she was there fighting, uh, she was there fighting the tax on mobile money on OTT, the minister was promoting it. <laughs> so, so you can just imagine your ED is saying this tax is bad. And the minister is saying the tax is what? Is good. All that is working in silos and we are going to eliminate this because we are now going, we have now uh, put in place an expanded senior management where all agencies are going to attend top management meetings so that we don't work also in one inside. And with this combined effort, 
we are going to make it. As I conclude, I implore both the public sector and private sector to adopt IDES for measuring the implementation of digital tra transformation programs. This should be complemented through investment in research. I think research here is very, very important. This is the only thing that is going to improve this sector. Recently, I was asked a question by journalists, but you know politicians will have answers to every word, questions. But I know how to deceive them. Because they ask me how many people have access to information in the country. Very complicated question. And I told them when I next come back, I will be having the figure. And I have never gone back to them. Because <laughs> <laughs> because what you are doing now, what we are what we are launching now is what will lead me to know how many people have access to what to information. But I knew we were working on this, and when I go back, probably after three months, I will have some some, some information. <laughs> but I will keep dodging them that I'm still looking for figures. My EDs phone is off. I wish to con congratulate my ministry team under the leadership of the permanent secretary, who is actually new, and all of us ministers are new, and you will see a very vibrant sector because you have not been part of the history of this ministry. And we want to live as if this is the last day in the ministry. And that's what we have said. Every day we should live as if it is the last day in the ministry and we should leave impact in the ministry. So we shall need your collaboration. So our, 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 our peers and the team, and also the leadership, and, and together with our expert, Dr. Tusu. Dr. Tusu, I thank you very much for not being mean with the knowledge. There are some people who are so mean with the knowledge that they don't want to pass it over to someone else. But you can see now, my father is a retired teacher. But every time he meets people, he, he told, he's very happy. He told Dr. Chiong, and he has always told me, that man you see there, I'm the one who did what? Who taught him. So you should be proud to see your people taking up the, the IT sector. Because for you, when you talk, someone wants to go back to school to study IT. Because you talk as if IT is the only thing on earth that can transform this country. But it's also good that you have impacted knowledge. In Makere, we used to have a, a, a lecturer who I'm not going to mention, something back. If you don't buy his book, he was teaching us money and banking. If you don't buy his book, then you wouldn't pass his what? <laughs> you wouldn't pass his, 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 his course. He would ask you, did you buy the book? <laughs> Once you say no, then automatically you will fail the what? The course. And you know, that was bad. Because up to now we remember that we had to, <laughs> to take it takes in his course, even when we knew what was it, because we didn't buy the what? The book. So it's good. You are not mean with knowledge. You have trained people who are now taking over from you. Whether you like it or not, you'll expire. Either naturally <laughs> or, or, or by force, you expire. These guys are even going to be better than you one day. So it's good you have not been mean with knowledge. And we thank you for spearheading the, the, the development for the IDS with the support from UNCDA. It's now my singular honor and pleasure to declare inclusive digital economy scorecard report 2021 officially launched. I say all these for God and country. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, we request you to stay on the platform as we are ready for you to sign. Uh, to discuss the government secretary also to join. Sign as well.
the value of Can we can the team help us to clear this local means that we have to go to the Commissioner, go ahead, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have breakfast prepared for you, so please feel free to go and, and serve. 